on Africa Health Check. If another pandemic comes up, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to absorb that. I don't think we're ready. We just pray that we don't have another one because uh, the last pandemic, we lost about a number of people from COVID and we're not willing to lose our relatives again. We discussed the continent's public health surveillance status. I don't think Kenya is ready for anything, for now. And discussed through ways the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced the need for improved health surveillance moving forward. Welcome to Africa Health Check, where we reflect on Africa's health status. I am your host, Hohontle Jang Paladi. On today's episode, we will be discussing the continent's public health surveillance status. And to help me unpack this topic, our special guest for today is Dr. Evelyn Gitau, the Director of Research Capacity Strengthening and Acting Director of Research at the Africa Population and Health Research Center. I'd also like to welcome our usual commentators, Dr. Mary Ann Morethi, who's the current chair of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology and a senior research fellow at the University of Nairobi in Kenya, as well as Reverend Anthony Achampong, who is a pharmacist and a pastor from Ghana. Remember, we are discussing the continent's public health surveillance status, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Evelyn to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and thank you for um, that um, introduction. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Evelyn. I did talk about your current work title, but maybe just briefly give us a background of uh, who you are, where you're based, and how did you find yourself working in this line of work? So, um, interestingly, I, I, I have had... Um, as a researcher, I think my, 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 my path to where I am now has been an interesting path. I started off as a researcher at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, um, gosh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, my work was really focused on malaria and trying to understand how to better diagnose children who had um, uh, brain infections. So, so that's where I started. And along the line, I got a small grant to try and um, come up with some biomarkers that would help us distinguish these diseases. And then there was a frustration because, you know, when I say $100,000, everyone will say, yeah, that's a lot of money. But actually in, in diagnostics and in producing and in R&D, and I'm sure um, the Reverend will tell you very um, clearly, this is very little money. I mean, the, the scale of money that we need to um, manufacture diagnostics on the continent is really high. And that's why we keep having to adopt and adapt and be consumers of other people's um, diagnostics. So that led me to the next point in my life where I said, come on, we need our own fund for R&D on the continent. So I, I, I was a founding program manager for the Grand Challenges Africa, which was funded in partnership with the Gates Foundation and um, Canada and other players and also trying to get governments to invest in this. I did that for a couple of years. Um, the, by the time I left the fund, it was a $10 million fund. I now work um, in terms of looking at capacity strengthening for ourselves as researchers, but also for policy makers and for those who may want to fund but don't clearly understand what would happen. So um, I'm getting more business oriented as a scientist, but this is a language we have to learn to speak if we want R&D on the continent to address issues that we've seen, especially during COVID, where you can't, um, you can't test enough. And the, 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 the last mile diagnostics, you know, those who need cancer diagnosis quickly and early um, outside of urban cities on the continent will not get it unless we make these major investments. Over. Absolutely in agreement with you. I mean, it goes without saying that public health as well as R&D closely resonates with you. Today, we are talking about public health surveillance. And for anyone who's watching and wishes to follow this conversation, I want you to just sort of start off by laying the foundation. What are we talking about? What are we looking at here uh, when we are referring to public health surveillance? 
So, so, so public health surveillance is, of course, where um, governments and, 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 and those who are in charge of understanding disease patterns um, um, collect information and data, you know, in, in terms of what's happening. So, so I'll give you um, an example of like where we are right now in Kenya today is we're in June 2022. We have a flu epidemic going on. We have a surge in COVID. We surprisingly um, have a surge in um, pneumonia. In, that's a disease that is covered by vaccines for children. And we have vaccines. So how would we be able to know when these epidemics are coming, when these small um, hotspots are happening in and areas and prevent them if we don't um, have surveillance data. So public health institutions need to have information. They need to, to track. They need to be able to tell because you need to actually roll out. Um, I'm, I'm giving a simple example, but the simple example is maybe if we had started using masks again three weeks ago, uh, the COVID um, surge that we're seeing now would have been prevented. But actually, the modelers had told us that. that. So surveillance allows us to have accurate information that informs interventions. And, and, and that's what we're talking about in terms of surveillance. Thank you. And what would you say are the characteristics of what we would say a good public health surveillance system? And you could cite maybe examples in countries where uh, they have a very effective public health uh, surveillance system. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to smile at the, the word effective public health surveillance system because, again, COVID has exposed many things that um, um, the continent believed. So I'm going to start by trying to explain what I think we believed was an effective surveillance system and what I think an ideal um, public health system would look like in terms of surveillance that would allow us to be able to to address the inequities in health. So um, before COVID, um, we all assumed that northern partners actually have proper surveillance systems and can quickly track and detect and intervene as appropriately as we could. Now, if I were to take a stab at it, and um, and, and I'll speak for many countries, and you've all seen the data, um, many countries are, have actually not been tested for COVID as much as Africa has been testing, okay? We were challenged by the fact that everyone said COVID is going to kill millions on the continent. But by the time it was coming to, to our country, we had a lot of people throwing on at, at us many, many freebies. But then when you look at a, a country like the UK and you compare the level of testing that was happening in the United Kingdom in comparison to countries in Africa, it was actually comparable. And, you know, in fact, we probably tested a lot more initially than they were. So, so, so what does that say about um, an effective surveillance system? Is that... Our beliefs that the North do it better than us, number one, we need to stop at that point and say, actually, they don't. We have had good examples of actually why we can and do do some things better. In situations where we were presented with um, epidemics, you know, um, the Ebola so as actually learn how to very quickly start doing things and testing when we need to, we actually have built some surveillance capacity that equals um, any country's surveillance system. Now, what do we need, though, in terms of effectiveness of that type of capacity that we've slowly built? We need to scale it up. Now, that's where the equity question comes in. Um, in terms of scaling up, have we actually got the resources to scale up? Do people see the need for us to scale up the type of surveillance that we're talking about? Um, I, do, I don't think we do, but we do have um, the ability to do that if we actually improved and linked surveillance to effective R&D. Um, so technologies for cheap diagnostics um, that would allow us to cheaply collect information, technologies of investing in artificial intelligence, for example, so that we can actually um, analyze the information that we're getting. These are things that the, the, the North northern partners are doing better than us because their computer capacity, their artificial um, intelligence capacity surpasses us, not in terms of um, uh, knowledge, but in terms of, um, uh, you know, infrastructure. Um, I think we can definitely learn from many things, but I'll, 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 I'll be a bit... Um, you know, I'll give you an amusing 
thing that we've been looking at lately, this monkeypox um, thing. Africa had information and data about monkeypox. We knew what was happening. So we're not as badly off. I think we just need to use our own data to make our own, um, our own surveillance work for us. Others then saw a few numbers and they, they screamed about it. So it's not that we are bad at surveillance. We just have to scale it up to ensure that it's, 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 it's informing what we need to have it in place. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's, it's a, I, I'm totally in agreement with what you're saying. It's also about where the data is available, what we do with that data. You know, I was just looking at the news the other day that the, uh, South Africa recorded its first case of monkeypox. And I was thinking, you know, if this does not get in, under control, it's going to fuel mass hysteria as we saw at the beginning of COVID-19. But it seems so far, we're all interested in just saying, you know, monkeypox is at our doorstep. But what are we actually doing with that information is also really important, right? I'm going to go to Dr. Mary Ann. And I want you, uh, just from your experience as a medical practitioner, share some concrete examples where uh, public health surveillance systems played a really pivotal role in responding to a pandemic or an outbreak and uh, helped in uh, prevention as well as control of an illness. So thank you very much and great to hear um, Evelyn and uh, the clear message that is coming out from here. We need to invest and invest more particularly on the local talent and what we have here and now even to hear about artificial intelligence. Um, I can give you one of few ex examples where public health surveillance has worked or it's working and um, it's not on the African continent, it's actually something I read as, as I've been following up today and it's um, uh, they have noticed that there's polio, you know, polio in the UK. And these are countries that had eliminated polio almost decades ago. And how did they detect that? By actively um, doing surveillance, looking at their sewage, because some of these viruses can be detected even before we start seeing symptoms, because sometimes they're excreted uh, in some of the waste products. So they've been doing constant surveillance, and I believe also they've been doing this to note or to see if there's any COVID or SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus um, rising within any population or cities or towns within the UK. And surprisingly, they've seen polio and now this has made headline news on the BBC and CNN because, again, I think only three countries in the world have, have remained to, uh, to, see, to be seen polio because, again, of failed surveillance, a war and, and, and other um, uh, collapses of the economy. So having a first world country seen polio is a big news. And again, um, they can look at it in either way. The surveillance is working, so they're upping up on calling everybody that is eligible for vaccination to go for their vaccination. They started a debate of an old disease and everyone is trying to go back to their books. What was polio again? Um, but anyway, here in Kenya, uh, we always do active surveillance as well. We try and detect. Our team at the University of Nairobi was one of the first teams that detected some bats in some caves in Taita Taveta carrying some particular strain of, of Ebola virus. And this has been published and passed on to the relevant authorities so that we can watch out any febrile Ill illnesses, what we mean, any unusual fevers being reported around these villages where we have detected this. And that's how it should work. If you'd ask me, what are we lacking now? Because again, uh, the African continent is not lagging that much behind in terms of detecting, noticing anything unusual. What we may really need to up our game on is artificial intelligence and then communication. We need to really communicate to our population, educate them what they need to watch out for, and also how to prevent. And Again, that's one of the purposes of this program of us being here, having these candid uh, discussions on what we need to do and talk about various illnesses, infections, and trying to make sure that the public, we are moving on one step together with the public, with the funders, 
different stakeholders, the governments, and that way, I think in Africa, within the African continent, you'll start seeing an upsurge of R&D, of us having our own solutions to our own problems. And again, the world will start looking up to us for those solutions, and I'm happy that Evelyn has talked about even monkeypox, which we started reporting and, 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 give, and seeing monkeypox many years ago. So I, I think if we had enough investment, we would be the first of, of the peoples in the world with a vaccine and you know, talking about who needs it most. But anyway, we will get there. Absolutely agree with you, Dr. Marianne, and I'm happy that you talked about the importance of communication because I think in the next show, or the one after that, we are going to be focusing on the importance of communication in public health, um, which is something that we tend to overlook in the response to public health emergencies. Now, Reverend Achempo, maybe you can also weigh in and share uh, some of your experiences or that you know of where public health surveillance uh, was really impactful in responding to a public health issue. You. Yes, Ghana was blessed to escape Ebola uh, invasion into the country, partly because of the robust uh, systems that were uh, put into place and you know, where surveillance is concerned. I remember that on all borders, you know, uh, Ghana with Togo, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, uh, people coming in, you know, apart from the airports, uh, there were uh, groups of um, uh, health officials who were uh, screening people, screening people. And uh, the concept of uh, public surveillance is not a static, it is an ongoing, it's an ongoing system. It's something that is always uh, in progress. And uh, uh, you'll be shocked to know that just about a week or within a week, there has been a one reported case of somebody with Ebola in the northern part of Ghana. And this actual reset was in 2013 to 2016. And I do believe that they have maintained uh, continuous our uh, ongoing research uh, into finding who might carry Ebola. And just within a week, somebody, one person, has been found to uh, have contracted Ebola. So it is, it, is, it is the way to make sure that our people are living in good health. After all, that is the goal of public health surveillance, to promote health and to protect the health of our people. So we encourage our, our government leaders, our health officials to uh, invest and to uh, uh, extend their wings of surveillance and not make it only an academic and a scientific exercise. So Ghana is up, is, you know, is warm up to the idea of public surveillance and it's working. It's, it's working very well. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Reverend Achampong. So we have talked about the importance of public health surveillance and early detection and early intervention. On the other side of this, we will be making the case for enhanced investment in public health surveillance system. But let us do that after this break. Let's hear what people on the street have to say. Yeah, I do believe in my country. I feel we can detect a, a pandemic. We have researchers, we have uh, Kenya has uh, very many learned people. We have the Camry, we can do that. Another pandemic, I don't think so. We have not been, ever been ready for anything. We've always been catching up. So if another pandemic comes, I think they'll still catch us flat-footed. Uh, truly, when we just work together with the government, if the government, if they will put the uh, those policies which are needed for our country to grow, then they will do the need if they will really do the need if so that we can do the best for our level. Welcome back from the break. Just before then, we were discussing public health surveillance system and how they play a pivotal role in early detection as well as early intervention and in responding to public health uh, matters. But now I want us to make the case for enhanced or increased investment in R&D for public health uh, surveillance system. But before we go in there, Dr. Evelyn, I want you to just briefly share with us what are the current trends uh, regarding 
emerging public health surveillance system in terms of innovation using the latest fourth industrial revolution technology like uh, uh, earlier on you were referring to AI, nanotech, any trends that we need to look forward to? Um, I, I, I get frustrated that we cannot afford to 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 make our our mixes and and the the reagents that we need to go into some of this R and D is too expensive to to get locally. So we have to import some of these things. As the minute you start importing um, reagents and you start importing raw material for anything, as you all know in in industry, this drives the cost up. It makes it expensive. So um, China's um, uh, rapid diagnostic tests are always going to be cheaper than the ones we have here because we, our hours that are home developed and homegrown are too expensive. So, so in terms of um, the real investment, there are a couple of things that we need to first start looking at is what are the raw materials that we use and how can we make that cheaper? That's the first question. But I think related to that question is our energy sources. We have such huge problems in making energy cheaper. So how do we um, talk to policymakers to think about how we fuel, how we make R&D cheaper? Energy needs to be the, 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 the primary part of that discussion. And I'm not in that space, but I know there's a lot of conversation that's going on about um, um, electricity and R&D and how to, how to make it cheaper, oil, you know, there, there are things that we could be doing. Let's say we don't have the, the money to do the initial R&D. Can we make adoption cheap? Can we make things cheap for us to use? So as a Kenyan, there are things that I say we can actually do. Technology is something in Africa that we've embraced more than the, 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 the rest of the world. Our financial system is actually improving at a rapid rate because we the telephone technology and the mobile technology has become something you can use in rural areas. So if we can do that, if we can very rapidly embrace technology, there is a factory that is now actually making microchips here in Kenya. And that's going to change. I mean, in, in, in a space where COVID then made, made it difficult to get some of these things to build telephones, ETC, there are things we can do, but we need to have the right conversation with the right people and in the right way. So when I'm presenting, I need to make a rapid diagnostic. Actually, I need filter paper to be made in Kenya. I need filter paper to be made in Zambia, in Malawi. I need, you know, raw products in vaccines that are being made. They need to be made locally. We shouldn't be importing for any part of that um, place. And, and, and I think that's where we need to start. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Evelyn. And maybe uh, to go to Dr. Mary Ann, uh, what would you say are the main priority areas that we need to start investing in um, in order to enhance the capacity of our institutions to uh, carry out public health uh, surveillance? Yes. So for me, I'm always, I think, throughout the programs, I'm very passionate about the most powerful weapon we have against infectious diseases, and that is vaccines. We need to be able to make our own vaccines. We need to be able to strategize who needs it the most. And we need to continue educating our people what vaccines are and what they're preventing. And these are the gaps we saw when we were first hit by COVID. And also, I, I, I will not repeat, when the vaccines are first rolled out, again, we're waiting for the remnants coming from the Western world. So if we can just sit with stakeholders, governments, researchers, and every other relevant relevant body create a space where we can now start talking about vaccine manufacturing. And I'm quite excited to see that, I think was, that was yesterday in Kigali, where they're having the Commonwealth big meeting, where all these world stakeholders, they broke ground for one of the first mRNA um, vaccine manufacturing plants in Kigali. There's also that conversation in Nairobi and on South Africa. So I'm really excited to see in the next five years what the potential of Africa will be with all these investments, everyone looking at us for now the solutions because they have seen, hey, as uh, Dr. Evelyn has mentioned, they thought COVID would break us down, but it didn't. So meaning Africa has some potential and we need to start now investing in this. So for me, it's vaccines, communication and educating our people. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Marianne. And Reverend, back to you. So the research and evidence have proven the importance and the pivotal, the quintessential role that um, uh, surveillance systems play in responding to public health emergencies and different situations. But yet we are still struggling to secure the political will and the financing, especially domestically. What are we doing wrong? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I was, I was, I was referring to uh, Dr. Miriam's contribution about education and then expanding our capacity to, to uh, investigate vaccines and their ability to contain some of these uh, uh, ailments. Most politicians come into government um, for their own reasons, but I do believe that there must be a system where uh, you know, priorities are given, you know, in certain uh, dimensions, certain areas, because uh, let's, 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 let's come to it. Who would have thought that uh, UK, there can be a resurgence of polio in the UK, like uh, Dr. Miriam cited. But the truth of the matter is that even when a community has overcome uh, a pandemic, it is, it is not to say that the, 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 the virus are completely wiped out. So then there must be the need for an ongoing research, ongoing capacity building in order to contain, and besides that the vaccines are mutating almost every day. So why not, why not understand this and then uh, provide the political will and the funding to be able to secure the help of our people once again a healthy nation is a wealthy nation, and this doesn't need any explanation to our political leaders. Yeah, education, and then people to communicate. I do believe that the churches must come on board. I'm a pastor. There must be a section in our teaching, in our preaching, where the health of people are also talked about in the pulpit. So it becomes a concern of all. Thank you very much for that, uh, Reverend Achampong. And I'll take a parting shot from uh, Dr. Evelyn. Maybe you could just give us your last words regarding the status of public health surveillance systems in Africa. Thanks. So, so, so I think the, 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 the parting shot I have really is to talk about the fact that we cannot achieve um, uh, the goals that we have if we don't think about equity. So we can't concentrate the resources that we're talking about in sm small particular areas. Everything we've talked about in terms of surveillance is actually available in big cities on the continent, but we'll never achieve the type of impact we're talking about. Even the vaccine rollout, if you look at numbers, you know, big cities achieve the numbers, the percentages that we wanted, but the last mile diagnostics, last mile surveillance, and last mile rollout of vaccines, where you're reaching everyone in an equitable way is the only way we're going to actually change our health um, on the continent so that then we can focus on other things beyond um, uh, our poor health. Over. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Evelyn. That's actually a really powerful ending to that because like you're saying, some of these provisions, some of these services are available in big cities, uh, whereas ultimately it's not just about providing for a certain few. We cannot say we have reached our our ultimate targets in public health and universal health care if we are still not including everyone and in ensuring that access to health care is equitable and accessible to all, regardless of your disadvantages and your geographical location. So let us keep pushing to ensure equitable access to healthcare services. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Evelyn, Dr. Marianne, as well as Reverend Anthony Achempong. This has been quite a really insightful conversation and I hope that we'll have another show where we can come back and even uh, decipher some of the issues, some of the trends that are coming up and especially speaking to different stakeholders that can play a huge role in enhancing the capacity of institutions that provide public health surveillance across Across the continent. This is Africa Health Check. Do make sure to connect with us on all our social media platforms. We look forward to hearing from you. Until we meet again, same time, same place, same day. Remember that the future is Africa, the future is today.